So thank you very much. Yeah, I was I was here last year, and and when I got invited back, I'm like, it's a no brainer. I'm obviously going to come back. So yeah, thank you very much. I'm honoured. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm the author of uh, Software Architecture for Developers and the Creative Structurizer. My my career really dates back. It actually dates back 20 years. Someone asked me how long have you been uh, how long have you been doing software development recently, and this month it's 20 years, which is sort of a bit scary. Over the past four or five years, I've been flying around the world and, and basically helping teams understand what software architecture is all about, all, all about. And this talk is really a summary of my experiences over that time. So, you know, this is going to be biased with my experiences, so, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. Whenever we think about architecture, we always think about design. And if we take you right back to, say, the late 1950s, we had something called structured programming. Back in the 1950s, we had all of these languages, and they, they introduced things like go-to statements and jump statements, and the systems that were being built were just a horrible spaghetti ball of mud. And structured programming was really kind of craftsmanship version 1.0, and it was a way to get people to improve the readability and the design of the, of the programs they were writing. We skipped 20, 30, 40 years forward. One of the big things that, that's come out of the industry, one of the things we can all kind of point at, is the waterfall. Now, the waterfall isn't a, a kind of named way of doing things, but it's a, a set of processes and practices done in a sequential way. And the whole point of the waterfall is really about optimizing the stuff you learn early. So you spend some time up front solving problems, doing analysis, doing design. You baseline all that stuff, and then you move forward. So it's about creating a set of firm foundations for the rest of the delivery lifecycle. It's a very structured approach. Lots of phases, lots of gates, lots of checkpoints. And also, documentation is a huge part of lots of waterfall approaches. The one I guess we can point at as being one of the most familiar is this thing, SSADM. Has, has anybody used this? Is anybody using it today, though? Good. <laughs> so structured systems and design method, uh, again, it's a kind of a, a very end-to-end -end life cycle, seven stages, analysis, requirements, logical design, physical design, and so on and so forth. And it's a, a systems approach to building systems. Right, it's a full end-to-end -end life cycle. Why am I here at an opening keynote telling you about SSADM and Waterfall? Well, one of the big problems with these approaches is the long feedback loops. We go figure out a bunch of stuff early, a number of months or years goes past, and then we finally get some, get some software. And sometimes that software didn't really reflect the wishes of the people who sponsored it. The thing I will say about some of the Waterfall approaches is that they, they delivered the thing right. So because there was lots of structure and rigor being put into these processes, you got a high quality product, it just did the wrong thing, which is a bit unfortunate. To counter this, probably around the 80s and 90s, we had something like iterative and incremental development. There are lots and lots of ways to look at this, but basically it's about shortening the feedback loops. So getting the software in the hands of the people who need it as early as we possibly can. And there are some various extremes of different IID type methods. RUP, anybody used RUP before? A few more people, yeah. So RUP is a, is a really interesting approach to software development. It's, a, it's an iterative and incre incremental process framework. So you would go to, RUP, to, to Rational, and you would buy RUP, and they would basically say, go and customize it. But of course, nobody did that. So most RUP projects ended up being these ginormous waterfall-looking things, and that wasn't really in their intent. Because you can customize RUP in lots of interesting ways. It moved away from documentation a little bit, and it went towards uh, roles and artifacts. So if you go look at the RUP documentation, it says you need a team of business analysts and requirements people and designers and domain experts and whatever. And conveniently, I guess, Rational sold a tool called Rational Rows. And if you had a 100-person team, you would buy 100 seats of Rational Rows and everybody would kind of collaborate through the tooling. We weren't writing documents by hand. We were generating documents from the models, from the artifacts. Switch to the other side of that spectrum, and you had stuff like RAD, Rapid Application Development. And this was very much, you know, developer, user, business person sitting together, working around prototypes, mock-ups, rather than horrible, ambiguous uh, requirement specifications. Fast forward to 2001, and we get to where we are now, Agile. So a lot of this has really been leading towards Agile. I see Agile as a culmination of a bunch of these ideas, essentially. And if you look at the Agile Manifesto, on the face of it, it turns everything on its head. You know, historically, we've been doing processes and tools. Well, let's do individuals' interactions. Let's get people conversing and collaborating instead. 
processes and tools. That's still important, but we value the individual's interactions as well. Comprehensive documentation. You know, a lot of teams were not actually delivering software, they were just delivering documentation, so that's a bad thing, let's fix that. So again, it kind of throws a lot of things on its head. And ultimately, from an architecture perspective, this led to lots of conflicts, or lots of perceived conflicts. And the first one really here is about team structure. It's the, do we need a single architect, or is everybody an architect? And these are the sorts of conversations I, I hear amongst teams even today. Now, of course, if you go back 12 or 15 or 20 years, this became a derogatory term, right? I would go and introduce myself as a software architect, and some people would say, that's nice. Can we talk to the developers, please? OK. And of course, you can trace this back to some of the horror stories of old. Big upfront design, analysis paralysis, producing lots and lots of heavy, comprehensive documentation nobody bothered with. It's the astronauts, the ivory tower architects. And that was kind of the image that a lot of people wanted to kill off. And it was because people treated software development like a relay sport. When I was in London, I, I interviewed a guy who, who did this. His job title was Solution Architect. And basically, he would go to customers. This is a, a consulting firm. He would go to customers, do architecture, create some sort of document, and throw it to a team. And that's all he did. He was never actually involved in building the thing. And, and I said to him during this interview process, how do you know your design's going to work? Which he was massively offended by, by the way for some reason. And I said, no, seriously, if you're not being involved in the delivery of this thing, how do you know it's going to work? And he basically said, I don't. It's their problem. It's an implementation detail. And I was like, whoa, you're an ass. <laughs> I didn't actually say that, of course. Um, but, but this whole way of working is also ass. It's architecture as a service. You know, it's just an upfront exercise. We get an architect in, they do architecture, they leave. That's not what software, software development's about. So, Forget all this software architecture stuff, we, should, we get agile architects. And you know, back 10 years ago, I did see people calling themselves agile architects. I have no idea what this term meant. I assume it was something about sticky notes and whiteboards. But the buzzwords were different, the buzzwords were better. Yagni, system metaphors from XP. Last responsible moment. Refactoring, evolutionary architecture, all of this stuff. It just sounds cooler, doesn't it? If you go to the Agile Manifesto, you look at Principle 11, it says this. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Two really interesting things here. Number one, Agile talks about architecture and design. That's excellent. The thing that bugs me is the self-organizing team part. Because I saw lots of organizations they kind of read this, and then they thought, well, we should have a self-organizing team. We should aspire and strive to create a self-organizing team. But they didn't really have the background to back that up, you know, the, the core prerequisite knowledge. I heard people say this. You can go and do a, a search on the web for this term, and you'll see people saying, we're going agile. We don't need these thinking architects, because we want to do something different. We want to share the architecture rollout amongst the team. We want to create that self-organizing team. That is possible. I've definitely, definitely seen that work. I've definitely seen this work, and I, I've definitely seen teams where they have, you know, really successfully spread the architecture rollout amongst everybody on the team. The thing here is, when you're talking about roles and self-organizing teams, a lot of the time, the word or, or, or the term jointly responsible comes into play. So as a team, everybody's jointly responsible for the architecture in this case. And while that can work, a lot of the times I just saw teams where there was actually no responsibility whatsoever because everybody else thought someone else was doing the architecture and no one was really taking ownership. And that's one of the big problems I, I see with a lot of people striving towards um, self-organization. You could argue that they weren't self-organizing, that's kind of the point, I guess. The other conflict here is really in the process and the approach. It's the, do we decide everything up front, or do we do it as we go along? It's the evolutionary architecture approach. And of course, historically, there has been this tendency towards big upfront design. 
you go and do lots of thinking and talking to people and workshopping and you get all the requirements, you do some analysis, and then you create some notion of a design of an architecture. And that seemed to go against moving fast and embracing change and responding to feedback and just delivering stuff early because we spend so much time doing all this thinking and, and you know, how's it compatible with this? The Agile Manifesto. Responding to change over following a plan. Big upfront design sounds like planning and creating a plan, a set of blueprints that people can work from. So therefore, well, let's not do this. Of course, the value is in planning, not following the plan by the letter. And again, this is a, a, a key distinction I think a lot of people missed. So I saw some teams basically jump from one extreme, big upfront design, to essentially nothing. And again, you can say, Simon, this is a straw man. You didn't really see this happen. No, I still see this happen today. I still go into organizations and they said, we've gone agile. And we're not doing any design or documentation anymore. And I'm like, what? That makes no sense whatsoever. They tell me they do evolutionary architecture instead. Again, this can work. I've definitely seen examples of evolutionary, uh, evolutionary architecture working. We do a little bit of design before we need to deliver some value. That, that's fine. The problem is this is hard. If you get the decisions wrong, if you get the decisions in the wrong order, sometimes you find yourself kind of going down a path and having to backtrack. And, and, and I do honestly see teams who try to get a four-week refactoring sprint because they're just trying to unwind some decisions they made or some technical debt they've accumulated. Also, there are some decisions that don't work well even in an evolutionary approach. Security, scaling, availability, you know, some of those core foundational building blocks tend to work best when they're baked in from the start. I've heard people say this to me, but somehow there is this perception that TDT, TDD equals design, architecture equals design, so let's just swap the things out. For me, architecture is about putting boundaries for TDD to work inside, essentially. I hate this term. I really, really, really dislike this term, the last responsible moment. The, the thinking behind the term is sound. The intent behind the term is sound. This is basically now synonymous with let's not make decisions ever. It really is in some cases. I, I just, just really dislike the term. And finally, whilst I'm having a little bit of a rant, I go into organizations and they say we're agile, and I talk to them about architecture and design, and, and, and then they say, are we allowed to do upfront design because we're agile? Face palm. So that's you know a quick summary of my experiences of going and seeing different teams and, and how they've progressed or, or gone backwards in some cases from the waterfall style days to where we are now. And I love this quote from Dave Thomas, not the Agile Manifesto Dave Thomas, the other one. Big design upfront is dumb. Doing no design up front is dumber. This is just such a fantastic sentiment. And this, to me, epitomizes a lot of what we've seen over the past few years. We've jumped from one extreme to the other. So, how do we solve all this stuff? How do we fix these problems? Well, I think in order to fix these problems and get to some resolution, we need to understand what Agile is, and we need to ask ourselves, what is Agile anyway? This is hard, it turns out. It's hard because we don't really understand what Agile means, and it means lots of different things to lots of different people. I think this is one of the core definitions we often hear. You know, being Agile, doing Agile is about moving fast, embracing change, delivering value quickly, getting feedback. Do you agree? This is really just iterative and incre incremental development done well and quickly, though. So there's nothing really in this definition that differentiates Agile from all the stuff we've done in the past. Maybe it's about being lightweight, you know, having a lightweight set of processes and practices. Again, that's how I see a lot of people interpreting Agile. So for me, that works. You know, a lightweight approach to delivering software, creating value. Or maybe it's the, the kind of fluffier stuff. Maybe it's about the mindset and culture of continuous improvement. 
It's the being agile rather than doing agile thing. And again, I think there's a lot of substance here. I was on Facebook at the weekend, as you do, of course, and uh, I saw a post from Bob Martin. And what was really interesting about this post and why I screenshotted it is because he says uh, he thinks the original subject email about the, the Snowbird Summit, where the Agile Manifesto was born, was entitled Lightweight Process Summit, which is kind of interesting. Again, that, that gets uh, you know, one perspective on this. And uh, Alistair here talks about the naming of the Agile thing. And he says how they voted for different names. And it was basically a tie between Agile and Adaptive. And again, I think that's really interesting because what a lot of people are trying to do now is they're trying to reclaim their Agile. And, and you'll see posts from some of the Agile uh, manifesto authors saying, Agile's been totally abused. And we want to get our, you know, the essence of being Agile back. And they often talk about um, continually improving, adjusting the outcome, being adaptive. So perhaps the, the, the name adaptive might have been a slightly better name for this thing, but you know, what's done is done now. The comparison here is following a process by rote over and over again. And again, I think that's one of the key elements a lot of people are trying to say here. Agile is about continually improving, adapting, changing your direction in the face of changing feedback. It's not just doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for the best. Of course, there are lots of really, really bad examples, and I'm going to pick on Scrum because why not? Everybody does. I see lots of teams adopting Agile and doing Scrum by the book. They do their stand-ups at 9.30 every morning exactly on the dot. They all stand up all the time. They ask the same three questions every day. And they just do Scrum like Scrum says in the book. And that's not being agile, that's just adopting a different way of working. That misses the whole essence of the continual improvement stuff. And, and what's interesting is, if you look at the values behind Scrum, the values behind Scrum match up with the stuff in the Agile Manifesto. But we, again, we kind of miss that stuff. So I think the, the wording of the Agile Manifesto is somewhat unfortunate. It's the, we value X over Y. But both things still have some value, of course. And, and I think in many people's minds, this created almost like a false dichotomy. It's either working software or documentation, not both. It's individuals' interactions or processes and tools, not both. And, and OK, that's people misinterpreting the manifesto. But that's kind of where we got to for some reason. The saving grace here is really the set of principles behind the manifesto. I think this should be the front page for the Agile Manifesto because it provides a, a huge amount of insight into what the whole Agile thing is really about. You know, there's far much more interesting information, detail in the principles than just those four sentences on, on that homepage. And the one I really like to, to pick on is this one. Principle number nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Again, the, the Agile Manifesto is talking about design. And it's talking about good design being a good thing and, and enhancing and enabling agility. And really, that's the key. That's the thing I've been banging on for years and years now. If you have a good architecture, that allows you to move fast. The, the catch here, of course, is it's not free. You don't get a good architecture for free. You have to put some effort into creating it. You know, what is a good architecture? We could talk about this for hours, but essentially for me, it's a, it's a well-structured, well-modular architecture. Uh, encapsulation, information hiding, you know, um, isolating change boundaries and that sort of thing. If you have a good, well-structured system, it makes changing that system so, so much easier. I also think the whole agility thing is a, is a non-functional requirement. It's a quality attribute. Because, of course, different teams building different types of software need differing levels of agility. Some teams need to move really, really fast, and others not so much. And maybe it's this agility thing, so how fast do you want to move that should guide your starting point for the architecture? Are you going for something monolithic, or are you going for something microservice-based, or something maybe in between? So the level of agility you need drives, again, some of the key architecture uh, decisions that you're making here. The thing I've been really pleased about, well, up to this point, it seems like I've been doing this all, all, all on my own. You know, nobody's interested about talking about architecture and design. It's basically just me. And, and now there seems to be this design revival, thankfully. So I'm seeing more and more teams thinking about architecture and design and, and how it can help them improve the way that they work. 
And if you get past the whole Scrum thing, some of the more modern Agile I don't know, process frameworks, Agile project management frameworks, Agile approaches or methods, however you want to call these things, they often have a design element in them. You know, whether it's architecture runways or an inception phase or like DSDM a turn, it has a foundations phase. And a foundations phase is essentially about creating firm and enduring foundations for the project. So what's really nice here is some of the more kind of um, modern descriptions of agile approaches and agile ways of working are saying, actually, there might be times where some design is necessary. And here's where those things might be applicable to you. But they also say, if there's no value in doing design, don't do it. And just go for the evolutionary approach. And I guess the thing for me is this is not about creating a perfect end state. When I'm doing an upfront design exercise, I'm not trying to create a perfect set of uh, blueprints that a team should follow. It's not a, a complete architecture. It's not something that's rigid and we can't change later. It's about having a starting point. It's a starting point for us as a team and the thing that we're building. It's the difference between having a detailed set of blueprints that we baseline versus setting a direction. So we can all go that way together as a team. It's essentially about continuous technical leadership. Three words, continuous technical leadership. Imagine we all go down to the waterfront, we jump on a boat, we point the boat vaguely to Ireland. I'm the architect, I'm the captain. I put the boat on full throttle and then I jump off. If nobody's there steering the boat and doing the course corrections, you're going to crash or you're going to be taken you know, off, off your route and end up in America somewhere. Continuous corrections, continuous technical leadership. That's essentially the, the essence of the architecture role, as far as I'm concerned. If you look through all of the Lean and Agile stuff, you can basically boil it down to these four words. Right? Do stuff if it adds value. Kill it if it doesn't. That's it. From my perspective, I think putting a starting, uh, a starting point in place for a team to work from is a really, really valuable thing to do because it gets us going in the same direction. It provides some guidance and boundaries and some, some consistency. I don't see the point of doing class level design for the whole system before we start coding. So that's the thing I'm going to kill off. That's just waste. I don't have enough information to do that up front, essentially. So when I talk about doing enough upfront design, enough upfront architecture, especially when I'm working with agile teams, for me, it's really about putting those firm foundations in place. It's firm foundations for the product, the thing, the system that we're building, and also us as a team. Again, so we're, we're creating that starting point so we're all going in the same direction. And for me, very simply, it's about structure. You know, imagine I have a, a blank whiteboard. I want to know something about the structure that I'm building, down to the level of, say, components in this case. I want to be able to share this information, this vision, this starting point with the rest of us as a team. So I want some nice, light way to document and communicate this information. And I also want to take care of the risks. I often get people asking me, we're doing Agile, we're not sure how to deal with risks. And my simple answer is, go and look at RUP. That's basically it. If you look at the Rational Unified Process, it's a, a risk-driven approach. It front loads the risk to the start of the project lifecycle. Same thing. Find the highest priority risks, deal with them. Experiments, prototypes, proof of concepts, stripes, traces, there are a whole bunch of ways to do this. To come back to the other conflict about the team and the team structure, whether you have one architect or many is a completely orthogonal concern. So the whole just enough upfront design thing can be done by one or many people. That's, that's completely irrelevant here. What I will say is, figure out where you are on this scale. In other words, how mature is your team? If you have a, an inexperienced team, an immature team, generally a single person doing the technical leadership, uh, leadership stuff works really well. It's sort of a, a command and control style approach with a view to pushing people to make decisions for themselves. There's a fantastic book by Roy Osharov. It's called, Elastic, uh, it's called Notes to a Software Team Leader. And in that book, Roy talks about elastic leadership. Differing leadership styles 
for different types of teams. It's a, a, situational, aware, a situational leadership model. And I think that's crucial here. Some teams work best with a single architect. Some work better when you do spread the role out. So this is all good, right? We've solved all the problems. We've brought Agile and Architecture back together. They're finally friends again. Hooray. I run workshops around the world. I teach this stuff. And I've noticed an interesting observation. And there's a kind of a generational gap here. After we finish my workshop, people with gray hair like myself, they say, that was great. We used to do stuff like this. And then we threw it away when we became Agile. And then I have another face palm moment. I'm like, what? Really? Why did you throw all this stuff away if it worked for you? Oh, because Agile says we can't do it. No, it doesn't. It's a misinterpretation again. On the flip side, I get a lot of people saying this as well. Right, this is all great stuff. We're really impressed and we're going to adopt it. Which is fantastic. It's very reassuring. Begs the question, what did, what did these people do before? And the answer is basically nothing or something that was very ineffective. And I think that's an interesting problem that we need to solve in our industry. Right, why is this happening? Why are we getting this generational gap appear? I see lots of conferences about agile software development and craftsmanship, and I wonder whether this is enough. I wonder, I wonder whether the things we speak about at these conferences and hear about and talk about are sufficient to solve some of these problems. I do wonder how far down the agile rabbit hole we need to go. I wonder if we're optimizing the wrong thing in a lot of teams. I see lots of people talking about agile coaching and optimizing the whole human dynamics of teams and getting people to work to, uh, together better. And that's fantastic. But I think a lot of those people are optimizing the wrong thing. Because a lot of the software developers I see don't have the sufficient set of starting point skills in order to be optimized. I'm going to bring craftsmanship into this. This is what the Wikipedia, uh, this is the first line from the Wikipedia page about craftsmanship. I get what this is saying. For me, it's a very narrow view of the world. I don't know if other craftsmanship agree. Yeah, I can see some nodding. It's, it's just, it's code focus. And I, and I think, you know, being a software developer, being a software craftsman is, is about much more than just code, of course. And ultimately, a lot of the things I see people talk about come back to clean code. It's TDD, it's refactoring, it's hexagonal ports, adapters, whatever you want to call these things. It's a set of techniques and practices to write good code so you get to nice clean code. The whole agile thing, embracing change, delivering value, getting feedback, having a set of lightweight practices and processes, continually improving them as we go through the life cycle and learn stuff. All of that needs a starting point, doesn't it? We start our agile project tomorrow. Let's put something in place that we're going to start with and improve. And I see a lot of people don't have that sufficient toolbox of practices to build that initial process from. Simple stuff like, how do you document your software? I get people asking me this all the time. How do I document the design of my software? I'm like, go on to Google. It'll tell you there's lots of approaches to do this. A more fundamental one, how do you design software? This is a really, really seemingly simple question. How do you design software? How do we take a whiteboard, a piece of paper, a wish list of requirements, and get to a notion of a design, a solution that we can share and communicate with the rest of the team. I ask people this all the time. It drives them crazy. The conversation usually goes like this. How do you design software? Pause. We use a whiteboard. Yeah, I should have seen that coming. It's the individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Let's get people together at a whiteboard having conversations. OK, I get that. What are you doing with the whiteboard? Because you can't write code on a whiteboard. Uh, we draw pictures. Yes. What are these pictures of? Uh, well, they are boxes and lines, diagrams to represent the design of our system, our solution. Right. You always have to ask why, why, why all the time. It's really annoying. What do the boxes mean? Well, the boxes represent components. 
Yeah, I should have seen that coming as well. <laughs> How do you figure out what components to draw on your whiteboard? You know, why is it three boxes and not four? And, and how do you come up with the names for each of those boxes? Silence. So you ask again. And you ask again. And normally someone at the back goes, no idea, we just use our experience. OK, that's the answer. How do you design software? We use our experience. How on earth do we teach this to people who are fresh out of university? I'm at the whiteboard. I'm drawing a bunch of boxes. My uh, apprentice uh, architect says, why did you draw that box? So I'm just using my experience. Great. It's a really unuseful piece of advice. When you start asking people, what is the essence of what you're doing? Is it decomposition? People say, well, what do you mean decomposition? Well, decomposition is a thing. You can go look it up. It's about taking a big thing and making it smaller. And it turns out there are lots of different approaches to decomposition. And, and this, this totally starts. People are like, wow, I didn't know that. It's like basic computer science stuff. Furthermore, you say, you know, there's a fantastic paper from the 1970s by Parnas and it talks about modularity and specifically around the criteria to decompose software. Because not every decomposition strategy is equal, of course. Whether it's functional decomposition or volatility-based decomposition, you know, the, the, the way that you modularize your software has a big impact onto the structure of that piece of software and therefore the agility of that piece of software. And this blows people's mind. They're like, wow, I didn't know we did stuff this in the, in, in the 70s. I'm like, yeah. You can blow their minds more by saying, you know this decomposition thing and this design thing? You can do it collaboratively with something like CRC. Classes, responsibility, collaborators or collaborations. You take a bunch of index cards, you take a, you know, historically this has been applied to use cases in, in the RUP world. You take a use case, you take a bunch of index cards, you get a bunch of people together in a workshop, and you start going line by line down the use case, and you, you start identifying the candidate classes that you're going to use to implement this use case. You start tagging and annotating the cards with, with uh, responsibilities, and then you add information about how these classes collaborate. Right, it's a really, really nice design workshop technique. But nobody does this anymore. Because we don't do class level design up front. We do things like TDD or we just write the code. But again, there's a, there's a practice here that you can take and adapt and put into your own environment, especially if you have a blank whiteboard. And very simply, instead of doing classes, responsibilities, collaborations, you do components, responsibilities, collaborations. So again, we take the same practice and we apply it to a higher level of, of abstraction. And this is a great way to come up with a candidate design for a system very, very quickly. Sometimes when, when I do these workshops and it's basically a, an architecture carter, I often see people literally just redrawing the requirements as a picture. And then they stop and they say, we're done. 10 minutes into the exercise, it's an hour and a half. Here's a picture of our solution. We're done. We're going for a coffee because we're agile. Right? And this is not a straw man. This has actually happened to me. And then you say, well, all you've done is you've redrawn a picture of the requirements. This tells you nothing about the solution. You know, what technologies are you going to use to implement the solution? And then you get all of this stuff back. Uh, that's an implementation detail. We don't want to get caught doing big design up front because that's bad for some reason. We follow the last responsible moment principle. Right, excuses, excuses, excuses. A lot of the stuff I read around clean code is around deferring technology decisions and also decoupling technology decisions. So let's make it so we can switch our database later. Let's, let's make it so we can switch our web framework later. Decoupling a tech decision is not the same as deferring it. Right, these are two separate things. Decoupling is good. Deferring is sometimes good. Remember, these are two separate things, because technology is not an implementation detail. If you are genuinely treating all relational databases as being commodity building blocks, then it's fine. You can do what you want. In the real world, Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, they have different costing options, uh, performance options, security options, you know, different projects, different requirements, especially around the non-functional stuff. Once we get through my workshop, people start drawing pictures. 
These are the type of pictures they draw. I promise I've not made any of these up. I have 15 gigabytes of photos like this from running this workshop around the world. I think like 10,000 people have done this now. Boxes, lines, arrows, crazy color schemes, diagrams that really don't make any sense whatsoever. We could literally just leave this playing all day and we go through my entire 15 gigabyte collection. But these are the types of diagrams people now think are architecture diagrams. When I'm doing this exercise, I will listen in to what the groups are saying, and I do hear people say this, right, we're drawing this box or this thing. It doesn't make any sense, but we'll explain it later when we do our presentation. What? Do you always present your pictures? What I do is a nasty trick. I, I get people to draw pictures and then swap diagrams. And guess what happens? They go, uh, we don't understand them. Don't know what this thing is. Why did you use pink? I don't know, because I had a pink pen. What's the shape? What's this box? What does this line mean? There's a lot of ambiguity built into these diagrams. And when you quiz people, they go, yeah, this stuff's really hard, actually. We don't really know what we're doing. We've never done this before. We don't have any guidance. We're not sure how much design we should do. We're not sure how much documentation we should do. We're not sure what level of detail we should go down to. Again, these are all the sorts of questions I hear time, time, and time again. And all this is about is good communication. It's about moving fast. I ran this workshop for a team last week, and after the first iteration, all the diagrams were crazy like you've already seen. And I, and, and I, asked, I asked the team, are you surprised by these diagrams looking so very, very different? And they said, well, we are, but actually we're not, because it explains why we have trouble communicating between ourselves. Yeah. You know, both within the teams and outside of the teams. And again, another fundamental problem here is we don't have a common language to describe this stuff. It's 2016, we don't have a common way to describe software. We think we do, but we don't, and I'll prove it to you. Right, quick quiz, what's this? It's a map of Swansea. What's this blue thing? Anybody know what the river's called? Right. What's a river? Right, it's a body of flowing water, perfect. So we all know what a river is. And we can use this knowledge to look at maps, go find other rivers, and, and go walk outside and find the river. What's this? Yeah, it's a floor pan for a bathroom. What's that thing there? It's a toilet. What's a toilet? Number one, number two. It's another body of flowing water, one way, of course. <laughs> Right, and using this knowledge, we can go outside and we can find more toilets. Any electrical engineers here? Yeah, so a couple of ways to represent electrical circuits. What's that thing there, that squiggly thing? It's a resistor. What's a resistor do? Slows down electricity. If I had a box of electrical components here on the stage, could you come and find me a resistor? Yeah, so you know how to identify resistors, and if you knew what the stripes meant, you could identify the, the power of those things. What's that? Last diagram? Uh, it's it close. It's a component. It's, it's, uh, well, it's two component diagrams. There's a UML 1.x version and a UML 2.x version. What are the boxes? Components. What's a component? I don't know. This one here looks like a database. Well, that's a database component. I don't know if that's a standalone thing. We've got applications and UIs over this side. I've no, no idea what that really means. But these things in the middle confuse me a lot. Are these standalone components like services, like microservices, or are they something to live either in the database or the app? No idea. And this is where we are in the world. To put this very, very simply, imagine we're building a web app talking to a database. For some of us, a component is that. For others, a component is that. So we use all of this terminology in a very, very ambiguous way. It's the irony of DDD. Domain-driven design talks about having a ubiquitous language between us as developers and the business people, but we don't have that ourselves. We don't have a ubiquitous language to stand here and discuss and describe software systems. So I need to wrap this session up, right? I've heard all of the possible metaphors you can possibly imagine now. Every time I go to a conference, it's like software development is like janitoring, surgery, 
gardening, what others have we seen recently? Right, we throw all these metaphors out there. Why? Can we stop doing this? How about we just say software development is like engineering? Is that going to get me shot at an agile and craftsmanship event? One thing I really urge you to do is go watch this fantastic talk by Mary Shaw. Mary Shaw works for the Software Engineering Institute, and she basically uh, shows you the history of the building industry and how the building industry started as craft and went to an engineering discipline. And she also does the same thing for software. And we're really in the very, very early stages of, of you know, software being a mature engineering discipline. But there's some fantastic stuff in here. And there's lots. I, I, I know we do the software is not like a building because it's flexible and malleable and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of really interesting similarities behind the scenes here in terms of the way that we work in the processes and the engineering decisions that we really start, need to start taking. To bring this back to this little history lesson I did at the start, I was doing some research on SSADM for some reason. And I found this tweet which I just loved. I don't know why we do learn about SSADM. It's a very old waterfall technique with unnecessary documentation. I think this is really important. I think everybody should learn something about SSADM or RUP or waterfall or structured programming or the stuff that happened in the past. Why? Because there's some good stuff in there. If you look at SSADM, it has a bunch of structured practices and processes that, that take you from requirements to design. How do you design software? We follow the steps in SSADM. We're done. We don't have to go through that whole whiteboard experience conversation. If you look at SSADM, it has a, a very hierarchical way of um, representing software systems, you know, hierarchical data flow diagrams, for example. I still see some people using that technique now. They find it valuable. RUP has the same sort of thing. There's a bunch of really interesting artifacts in RUP that you can take straight out and use. <coughs> the risk stuff from RUP is also really interesting. You know, front load the, the project with the risks. So this is a rather interesting question. Who's teaching this stuff? And the answer is nobody. Because it's not cool and it doesn't pay the bills. If I went around the world teaching RUP, I'd be totally out of business. I'd be living in a tent in the car park now. But again, there's a bunch of really interesting stuff in those older ways of working. The irony here is Agile. Agile is about continuous improvement, retrospectives, looking at what's happened in the past and reflecting on it and learning. And we don't do that enough. So my final point in all this is basically, let's go out there, let's go find some stuff that worked in the past, and let's learn from that and let's put it into our ways of working to improve the way that we work today. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of SwansiCon.